Eagle Eye in the Sky is fueled by Gatorade, the official sports drink of the Philadelphia Eagles. Anything that moves, I don't care who it is. Let's go. Give me everything you got. Play fast, play hard. Let's beat these boys tonight in their house. Go. It's party time. It's party time. Let's go. Touchdown. You are listening to the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Now here's your host, Fran Duffy. That's right, another week, and we are talking quarterbacks today as the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade, continues. I'm Fran Duffy, and I think we've got a great show for you here on episode number 178. At the top of this week's show, we've got Chalk Talk, where I chat with a friend of mine, Tony Rassiopi, a private quarterback coach for the Test Academy, just to talk about quarterback play. What goes into it from a physical standpoint, from a mental standpoint, from a technique standpoint. Tony works for, with quarterbacks all the way up from grade school, high school, all the way up to the professional level. So really want to pick his brain about what goes into the most important position in sports. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get into my chat with Tony here in Chalk Talk. Let's get down to business. It's time for Chalk Talk. Really excited to welcome in Tony Rassiopi, the quarterback coach over at Test Academy. And, and Tony, uh, before I start rolling off all the different roles you have and all the different things that you do, just give us a, a peek inside what your life is like. Take us through the full calendar year. What are the things that uh, that you work on and the, the types of players that you coach? Because I know you coach players from uh, you know young kids all the way up to professional athletes. Well, I appreciate you having me on, Fran. I um, you know, so it, it's kind of an interesting thing. So I, I am actually a high school coach at the Hunt School in Princeton in the fall. Um, which were prep school. Uh, we finished enrolled in the country last year. Uh, so that's obviously a great experience. That kind of takes me through, you know, like August, uh, through our season until like mid-November. And then um, and then once kind of December picks up, uh, I'd say like mid-December to around Christmas time, um, usually that's like, you know, high school kids kind of getting back into it once a week. Um, I train a, a ton of, of college kids from Division three kids, Division two kids, and I have like seven Division one starting quarterbacks from either New Jersey or the Tri State area that, that train with me. So a lot of those guys will kind of show up, uh, you know, once their semester ends or like after a bowl game. So you're talking, you know, like mid January. Um, you know, obviously they want to get their bodies rested and uh, and get back to being healthy after this whole long stretch they've had. But um, and then it's, and then also I train uh, NFL draft prospects. So um, those guys again, we usually show up. Once their career's over, so it could be, uh, you know, if they had a really bad season team wise, they could be here mid December all the way till, you know, like January 2nd, January 30th, so we start the six, eight, or 10 week program of tests where we train those guys, obviously, for um, for their pro days or if they're lucky enough to be drafted or uh, go to the combine. So um, that's kind of like my, my huge chunk is usually like January to uh, around this time, you know, so, you know, you're getting high school kids kind of prepared and working on fundamentals of the game. Uh, from, you know, sometimes uh, sometimes scratch. Um, you know, you're getting some really talented kids in, at the college level back in you, really getting them back to, like, focusing on mechanics and fundamentals. You know, the biggest thing I see, obviously, is when, um, you know, and, and I do it as a coach sometimes, like, through the course of a season, you, know, you, you kind of cut individual time out of your practice. It's more like group and team because you're putting in plays, obviously, and you're getting ready for an opponent. So sometimes your fundamentals um, – you know, lack because of that, or, or uh, you don't focus on them as much as you probably should. But uh, sometimes it's nice to get those guys back in and really get back to ground zero from a fundamental standpoint. Um, so usually that goes up until around this time now. So uh, obviously if I have some guys that are drafted or lucky enough to um, you know be invited to, to mini camps and OTAs and those kind of things, great. Um, you know, a lot of the college kids are obviously home because they're done with the year. Um, you know, and obviously the high school kids are kind of getting prepared for you know, thrown in front of college staff and uh, being invited to, you know, camps, obviously, to, uh, you know, especially those, those you know, juniors and senior kind of kids. We're trying to hopefully get a scholarship. So uh, getting those kind of kids prepared. Um, and that kind of rides me into the summertime, you know. So it's kind of fun because when the college kids kind of go back to school, I get, you know, some pro guys back in who obviously are uh, either under contract in the NFL or, uh, you know, playing overseas or, uh you know, the arena league and there's, I mean, there's so many leagues now to be a professional quarterback, which is awesome. There's so many opportunities. So, um, so that's kind of how it runs. And then obviously I took back up with my high school team, uh, you know, mid July to August and it's just a cycle again. Well, let's, let's focus in on the guys that are, are either going from college to the NFL or that are in a professional league. I want to ask you about just different technical things, different things about the, uh, the about the quarterback position that, you know, the, a lot of people like to talk about. Now, my first question for you is this, 
What is one of the issues that you kind of see as kind of overwhelming across the board that you know when a guy comes to you, this is a pretty common thing that you kind of have to work through. Like you mentioned, a lot of these guys uh, get away from a lot of the individual periods, a lot of those indie yeah. sessions in season. So when you get to them in the postseason, there are some things to clean up. Um, you know, it's funny. The, the big three common thing, well, three common things I see most with guys are that you could fix kind of right away or like what they use as a power source, right? So a lot of guys sometimes, you know, from a fundamental standpoint, they're just off balance at the top of their drop, and they're constantly using um, like weight transfer to be a power source, which gets us off balance and kind of pulls away from our power. You know, so like they're loaded on their back leg, or their their base isn't great. You know, if they're going through like a progression read, so so right away you can kind of fix um, use their power source, which you know at the end of the day we want to be like balanced rotational throwers is what I preach, right? So I want to be as balanced as long as I can, which means I'm going to be accurate, and if I'm using my hips as a power source. You know, I'm able to stay balanced and use my, um, you know, use my core and then get my elbow through above my shoulder, which again keeps me accurate. So it's kind of the perfect combination in our world of being, you know, accurate with as much velocity as possible. So that's you know that's number one. The second thing is, um, you know, your footwork. How do you make throws to your non-dominant side? Right. So I'm a righty. So like, what is my footwork? How does it get me opened enough that I can make throws to the left? So I, I see a lot of guys just aren't really well coached. Uh, either in the rhythm game or it's like, you know, throwing that 10 yard speed out, you know, against like cover four or, or like a soft man and you got to be on time with it. Um, you know, how, how is your footwork setting you up to be balanced and on time? And then the last thing is how do you hitch? Like, how do you, how do you reset your feet like through a progression read? So I see a lot of guys that, you know, either, um, you know, old school kind of theories to get as much depth as possible right off your drop and you have all that momentum going back and kind of explode off your back foot into your hitch, which means you're not going to be balanced. You know, and you're going to lose some power, obviously, on, on, on your uh, on the velocity side of things. And then again, God forbid, you had to go, you know, from one to two to three. You know, by the time you get to three, you're all over the place from a fundamental standpoint. So, really, those three things right away, I can kind of clean up, and you see a big difference in guys. Um, so that's you know, that's usually where I start. You know, it's uh, the interesting thing about the combine guys now, or, or or the draft guys, are you know, you have some kids who uh, you know pro style, right? So they're running 150. 150 plays or, or, you know, whatever they had through the course of their four or five years in college. And then you have some spread guys who have, you know, a couple different formations, right? Some a couple different concepts, up tempo, a couple formations out of it. And, um, you know, they're on the ball and they're going and it's very simple. So it's interesting to see the different systems and the different ways they were kind of taught, you know, so, you know, there's, there's a couple common concepts like Hank, for instance, right? So, you know, middle hook and then obviously reading curl flats on both sides. You know, it's interesting seeing the depth of, of those concepts and then how kind of guys are taught to go through progressions. It's, you know, sometimes I could have four guys, it's the same play, and all four guys are kind of taught something different. So, hmm. To me, like when you get back to that first point about uh, a guy's lower body, it's uh, it's so common. And obviously, look, all, all the things that we're going to talk about, uh, they're all going to be on individual basis, right? I got one yeah. quarterback isn't going to uh, learn things and uh, improve at things the same way as a second guy, but – to me, when you look at those guys with the, with the lower body, because it's such a, a, a common thing to see with guys, and everybody kind of says, oh, his lower body mechanics, his lower body mechanics, his lower body mechanics, his feet need to get fixed, his, uh, his upper body's not married with his lower body. Why is that stuff important? To explain to us why uh, a guy's feet and what his, he looks like in his lower half really affects what, where the ball goes and how it gets there. Um, it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's about being on time, right? So, like, when, when I drop especially in the rhythm game or like it's progression read, which means, you know, I'm going to go one to two to three. If I'm lucky, four to five, if I have that much time. But, you know, like you should be able to drop and you have to be on time to one. And if you're really good and, and you see a lot of the older guys, you know, you watch some of the Brady's and the, um, you know, the breezes of the world, you know, they'll get off one quicker just because they've seen a certain look so many times. So they're constantly on time to one and two. And then sometimes you're going to have to move just because of how good defensive lines are and stunts. You know, you're three and four. You got to be able to adjust and slide and climb in the pocket and waste. You know, buy some time. And, you know, find that that little window. But you know, at the end of the day, if, if you're a balanced thrower on time, the more likely you're going to be, you know, accurate in, in the right spot. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, you see kids that are taught. They're, you know, some will be taught to like say drop straight, right? And if I'm reading something, you know, outside high low, like why would I drop straight? Which means I'm going to be like that count late. You know, to high, let alone if I had to go, you know, most guys are taught high to low in those concepts, right? So if I'm going high, low, I'm going high for a hitch, you know, corner bails or, or strong safety drops or, you know, whoever you're high low. And by the time I get to the low, sometimes, sometimes you're like on the third hitch. 
Mm-hmm. You know, so then you're, obviously you're going to be late, you're going to be behind, and you're going to get hit probably, especially at that level as you're throwing it. So, you know, if, if I can be on time with my feet and aligned, the more accurate I'm going to be. You know, so um, it's it's really how I take those last two steps of my drop are really everything. So it's that, like, that last crossover step sets my angle and gets me bounced. That way my plants will get hit under my body. So, like, I preach to always make straight throws. Um, so how do I do that? I do that with my last crossover step. So if I, if that last crossover step sets my angle to, say, the left, then my back foot just hits and I'm making a straight throw. I don't have to – the guys that struggle are the guys that always drop straight, get on their back foot, and then they kind of swing every throw. And when I swing, A, I'm off balance, and B, my shoulder and my foot, and this is kind of what you were talking about before, if my shoulder and foot go together, I'm going to swing to those throws. I'm not really going to get a lot of – you know, hip rotation core into that, and then my elbow is going to kind of drop and come across my body. And you see a lot of those guys will miss kind of like low and inside. Usually that's why. I always want to close my shoulder when I step, so I'm kind of cut my body in half. So when I step, I'm stepping slightly outside my throw. My shoulder's closing at the same time, creating all that torque to my hips and giving my elbow time to get up and extend and I'm accurate. Yeah, that's, that's one of the other parts of it is that is that off arm. Not enough people really talk about how much uh, or how important that is to the uh, to the release and everything and along those lines as well. Um, let me ask this question: What is the hardest habit for for these quarterbacks at this level to to break? Oh, um, you know, well, it's you know, I mean, some guys you're talking about they're 25 years old, right, and they've been playing quarterback since they're freshman year in high school, so you're talking 14 years old, roughly, right? So you're talking 11, 12, 13 years of maybe doing the same thing. Um, you know, the hardest thing to do sometimes as a quarterback coach is when a guy is really good at something, but it's not fundamentally correct per se or it goes against your philosophy, like how do you handle that? Like with me, I wouldn't change a guy just because I believe in certain things. Yeah. You know, so if I see somebody that does something completely opposite of kind of what I believe in, my whole thing with that guy is like, okay, listen, if you're going to do it that way, you know, and you've had a lot of success doing it, like, I'm not going to change that on you, but just understand, like, by doing that, you're going to, you know, you got to make sure you're going to do this and this as well. You know, so you kind of give them, you know, like rules and, and ways to fix certain things within the way they do things, you know. So sure. um, I, I would say the hardest thing is just, you know, again, getting a guy that's done something for so long and has, you know, a lot of success doing it, and you're kind of going to change him a little bit. And it's, you know, there's a lot of trust there, you know. So, you know, sometimes you get a guy for like the, um, you know, for, for draft prep, you might get him only, you know, six weeks, five weeks, depending on, um, you know, what, what the agent thinks, uh, how, how long they come out here, you know, um, and, and stay. Obviously, we're in New Jersey, so, you know, some guys want to get down to Florida and stay, you know, 12 weeks just because of the weather. You know, we're up here, it's a little bit different, so mm-hmm. we kind of have to manage the weather and, and uh, getting in facilities and getting indoors and those kind of things. So, um, you know, I just, you know, I think the biggest thing is when guys, uh, you know, when you change something you've done for a long time, you know, you're going to struggle at first a little bit because your body is so used to, if you're doing something wrong, your body is so used to kind of overcompensating and, and doing something else to kind of overcompensate for the wrong thing to kind of make it right so you're kind of successful. But you're really not going to be as consistent over time if you're not fundamentally sound. So, you know, I kind of go through that, like, two-week period where it's kind of like the ball's kind of overplaced a little bit and they don't really feel right. And then once it clicks, it's uh, it's fun to watch and, and – you know, a lot of times I'll get like, oh, Coach, I wish I did this. You know, I wish I learned this five years ago. You know, whether it's, you know, how you throw to the left or how you hitch, you know, or a certain way to drop for different route combinations. So, um, you know, it's pretty neat to see the progression over time. So now I'm going to go to the other side of the coin. Last week we had uh, Paul Alexander on, and we we're talking or a couple weeks ago now uh, about offensive line play, and he mentioned uh, working with a prospect that was in this year's draft, Greg Little, the left tackle from Ole Miss, and you know he looks at him, and everyone's talked about his ability to move people in the run game, and he said, "Well, look, I looked at Greg, and he's his stance pre-snap was so wide that he gained no ground with that first step, and was not able to generate any kind of power. That's not a a three-week fix. That's not a two-month fix." He said, "That's a five." Meant to fix. Is there anything like that when you're teaching these quarterbacks where you know maybe they've they've got something that isn't going well for them, and you can say, "Look, we we can fix that very very quickly." Uh, yeah, I, uh, sure. I mean, you know, like kind of the things I hit on before. So, like, um, you know, right away, like I'll ask some questions, like, "Okay, like, uh, what what foot in our drop gets us to bounce? Is it your last crossover or your plant foot?" And you know, the majority of guys will say, "What? Oh, my plant foot, coach." And I'm like, "Okay, well, if I want to be bounced, watch what you know. This is what you're telling me to do." So I show them, like, okay, here I am. Here, I'm, I'm on my back leg now. You know, so you see a lot of guys are taught to kind of be back leg loaded. And if I have, you know, 60% or more weight on my back leg, I'm naturally going to overstride or weight transfer to my front leg. So I'm constantly going to be staying on the ball, which, you know, 
back leg guys do when they when they push real hard off that back foot to transfer their weight and they overstride and they sail it because their shoulder pops up, or they get right on their front leg. You know, I was I used um, you know a lot of guys that play baseball understand this. Like, so if I get on my front leg, if I'm hitting a baseball, if I'm fooled on a curveball, what's going to happen with that hit? You know, I'm going to hit the weak ground ball back to the uh, pitcher or the shortstop. Same thing. We're we're kind of the same athlete. We're balanced rotational athletes. You know, just like hitting a golf ball. Like, uh, you know, I get a lot of guys that are obviously really good at hitting a golf ball, and it's funny because they'll, they'll weight transfer, and I'm like, you're a good golfer. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, like, how do you hit a golf ball? Show me how you hit a golf ball. You know, so they stand there, and they get in a great balance stance, right? And then they go to load their golf club back with their hands. And I'm like, look at you. Are, do you have any weight going back? And they're like, no. I'm like, all right, how would you hit? And they just rotate their hips. I'm like, we're the same athlete. You know, from a, from obviously from the hips and, and uh, you know, base standpoint. So, um you know, that's, that's the biggest thing I see is, is how, how I get balanced in my drop. And then just, you know, those little things like close my shoulder when I step. A lot of guys aren't taught those kind of things. And I'm lucky that, you know, either, you know I played it for a while and then I worked at the Manning Camp in the summer. Um, so I'm around such, you know, the best of the best. And, and you, it's kind of fun to see. Um, and it's such a copycat league. And even, even the elite guys, you know, even the Eli Manning of the world, you know, like they'll, they'll – They'll go and copy like what Brady's doing and or Breeze is doing. They all kind of steal from each other, which is neat to see. And then obviously, I mean, I'm lucky that I'm on that inside circle of kind of like, hey, what are you doing this year? Like, why, why are you working, you know, a quick game shotgun, like when you're throwing hitch or like a quick speed out? Why are you doing that to the right? Well, it, this gets me around faster. This gets me set faster. This gets me balanced faster. So, like, all those kind of things you're kind of staying up on each year. And it's kind of like, for me, it's always kind of like a checklist, right? So, it's like, okay, what, what am I teaching if this is different, why is it different? You know, so um, it's, you know, just because it's different doesn't mean it's good sometimes, right? So I don't change this change, but, um, you know, some, there, there's always this new information kind of coming out, um, you know, how guys do things. So, you know, like I, I always kind of taught, even throwing left, I was a big, like, bucket step guy because that was the way I thought. I mean, I was, you know, that was 1990s, early 2000s quarterback play, you know, West Coast offense, you know, rhythm drop, you know, bucket step, throw to the left. Um, and, and I changed that. You know, I met Kurt Warner a couple of years ago, and um, you know, we, we talked about how to throw left, and, and he just goes, why don't you just turn? You know, so turn your left crossover ankle to set your angle, and then your back foot just kind of hits out to the side, and your back ankle is completely lined up, straight throw. And um, it's like one of those like dumb moments, you know, where you do it, and you're like, why didn't I think of this? This is so simple. Um, you know, again, I see a lot of guys come in that bucket step, and when they throw it to the left, they're very inconsistent. You know, I see... You know, even the high end guys, you know, like, you know, you're talking, you know, second, third, fourth round guys, even first round guys, you know, when they throw a straight, I mean, they're, they're very talented, right? They're just, the ball just pops out of their hands. They're just, they're special. When they throw it to the right, they're still pretty good. And then when they, some, some of them, when they throw left, they drop, you know, considerably just because of their footwork. So if you can fix that, it's, again, it's about making straight throws, right? So if I make, if I make, if I'm straight on and, and a guy's 15 yards in front of me and I can throw the ball, you know, with a ton of velocity and ton of accuracy and, and be 10 out of 10, why not make the same throw to the left by my footwork? Well, Tony, I'm really glad that you actually mentioned earlier the the Manning Passing Academy because that was something I actually wanted to ask you about. Uh, there's always a lot of mystery kind of surrounding that event. You know, the, all the guys, all the top quarterbacks in the country, most of them anyway, all go down. They get together with the Mannings, other professional quarterbacks. They all get together, high school, college, NFL. Uh, I know you're involved with it, obviously. Like, give us a little bit of a peek behind the curtain because, uh, like I said, limited media access. What is it like down there throughout the course of the week of practice? Um, you know, so it, it's it's kind of kept secret for for a reason, which is kind of nice because there's no media. There's um, you, know, you see really elite people. Um, you know, and it's such a uh, such a fraternity to be there and, and so special to be a part of. Those guys kind of let their hair down and be themselves, which is kind of nice. So um, you know, nobody takes their cell phones out during the week. There's no videos of it. There's no uh, there's no Snapchats or uh, all the stuff you're kind of worried about. You know, in the general public, which is kind of nice. You know, so you can see. Um, you know, GMs and uh, assistant GMs. And, uh, I mean, and the nice thing about being there is you meet so many people, not just there to see, you know, the elite college guys kind of throw, but, like, so many people bring their kids there as quarterbacks. You know, so, like, that's where I met Les Snead a couple years ago as the GM of the Rams. I literally just, you know, 40-minute conversation, just kind of talking, just because his son was there. His son was uh, either in eighth grade or a freshman in high school. My, You know, my first year there, I had uh, Sean Payton's son was in my group. Uh, Mike McCarthy's son was in my group the following year. And they're there just kind of like see their sons, throw it around, and kind of hang out and, and network a little bit. So uh, that's kind of what you're around every day. You know, it's every time you, you turn around, you see the, uh, you know, Chris Mortensen, you, you know, you see these guys, and they're just, they're there to have a good time. They're not there to kind of, um, 
you know, find out secrets and, uh, you know, bash anybody or, yeah. it's, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a family environment, which is the best. So it's a, it's a four day camp. It's Thursday to Sunday. Um, the, you know, top tier college kids will get an invite obviously from Archie. And, uh, so they'll come in and, and, uh, you know, we'll train them. I'm one of the, one of the guys that gets to work with them on the field. There's, there's about six of us, um, that are lucky enough to do, do that. So it's, uh, you know, along with obviously Peyton and Eli. So we kind of split up in four groups and, and go through drills and fundamentals and see them rip it a little bit and try to teach them some things a little bit, um, let them compete a little bit of things. Um, so we kind of do that for about an hour and a half a day. Um, I mean, outside that, it's really a high school, old school skills camp, you know, so it's obviously quarterbacks, but then there's receivers and tight ends and running backs. You know, not a ton, obviously. I mean, we, it's more majority of a quarterback camp, but um, it, it's, it's a long day. It's, you know, Thibodeau, Louisiana, in uh, in end of June, so you're talking 100 something degrees with 100 percent humidity. So, us guys from the Northeast, we, we struggle a little bit the first day getting used to it, but uh, <laughs> it's it's all day. It's uh, we meet in the morning, and then uh, we're we're out in the field coaching for about three hours. And, and those college guys will kind of um, they'll have their own group, they'll have their own drills they got to teach. So you, it's kind of neat to see, you know, those guys kind of um, you know teach the game a little bit and stuff they've learned. Um, and be able to communicate that to, to kids that uh, you know think the role of those guys, and obviously watch those guys play on Saturdays, and they're in awe of some of those guys. Um, and then usually we'll we'll uh, we'll throw around lunchtime with the college kids, let them compete a little bit, and that's where you get to see the um, elite guys kind of spin it and drop. And um, you know I've been there for my seventh year now, I think. So I've you know I've seen every one of those top end guys spin it for the most part. So it's it's a neat experience to be in. So. Um, We'll be back out in the afternoon again, coaching for three hours, uh, skills and drills in the field. And then at night, we kind of do like a seven on seven thing, which is kind of fun. Um, and again, everybody's a quarterback, so it's kind of comical. <laughs> so, um, you know, so we'll do a seven on seven kind of for fun. We have our own teams. And then, uh, and then at night, we go, you know, go to dinner. Um, you know, somebody hosts us over, which, which is awesome. It's an amazing experience. You kind of just get to sit down and, and talk to kids and talk to, you know, the elite people in the NFL. So, um, Again, that's that kind of time where you can kind of pick people's brains and, uh, you know, you kind of tell stories and, and uh, you know, you get around, you know, Peyton Manning all day and you get to ask him what he was looking at, you know, on third and long and how he broke down stone. So, I mean, just those experiences are just amazing. So um, that's what it's like really for four days, you know. So it's it's a great experience. The college kids really spend time with, with Eli and Peyton and, and um uh, you know, like like the little things that you know, like you know, the average show doesn't think about. Kind of like how do you take care of your body through a season? What's your weight training program, right? Like you know, like uh, how many days a week do you do rehab? Um, in the off season, how many days a week do you throw? You know, uh, do you throw every route? Do you throw the route tree right and left every time you throw, or do you pick like four routes and you just you know you throw them ten times so you have that timing down and that's it. So it's neat to see kind of you know those guys interact with 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 the Mannings and uh, you know. A lot of people, um, especially in that level, um, they aren't who you think they are as people. You know, they, they look like somebody on front of the camera, and uh, it's kind of a front, and you, you hear some stories of who they really are. You know, it's kind of disappointing. Those guys are the best. And, um, you know, they are exactly who you think they are. They are class acts. Um, they will do anything to help you. Um, I mean, you know, Archie Manning's probably the nicest person I've ever met in my life. Um, he treats you almost like you're the Hall of Fame player, you know, so, and that's everybody. So, um, you know, it's, it's a great experience. It's like quarterback heaven, I call it, for four days. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew that that was something you were involved with, and I definitely wanted to ask you about it. It's Everything you hear about it behind the scenes is exactly what you described, and I appreciate you sharing that uh, with the listeners. My next question is this, and, and you know, look, the, this, the NFL draft process is so big now, and, and everybody uh, has an opinion on it and gets eyes on these college kids. What do you feel like is an overrated part of this when we're talking about evaluating quarterbacks? You hear uh, people in the media, people in fa- you know with fans uh, talking about these college kids making the jump, and then what's a part that's underrated that doesn't get talked about enough that's really really important for these guys going to the next level? Uh, I mean, o- overrated. I think sometimes the pro day is a little bit overrated. You know, like um, you, know, you see a lot of guys that uh, you know go go to pro days and they've had you know tremendous four-year careers, big schools in, in a Power Five conference. And, uh, you know, you go on the pro day and you throw 60 balls, and it's like, okay, oh, he's definitely the first pick now. Or he's, oh, he, he was okay today, but, you know, he, we respect him a little bit more. He's going to slide down. You know, so you know, I think I think for the, the combine guys, it's about just kind of checking boxes. You know, as we tell guys, obviously, when they come to us, is 
is uh, you know, like the majority of of I'd say eighty eighty five percent of of um, you know your draft grade is obviously your film, which it should be. So, you know, a lot of times I, I think that um, you know you see some workout warriors, and we've had you know guys that are hitting off the charts the last couple of years to test from a uh, from a you know from a testing standpoint. You know, at the end of the day, can you play football? You know, like are, are you are you coachable? Are you tough? Do you have heart? Um, are you a good teammate? You know, do you fit into a locker room? You know, those are the kind of things it's neat to see, you know, like when scouts sit down with a guy, that, that's, that's where it's at. It's kind of like, okay, like, let's watch your film. Let's see what you're really good at, what you're not good at. Is, is it a huge concern? Like, can we coach that? You know, is it something we can fix, or is that just the way you play? Um, and obviously, you know, those interviews are huge. People have no idea how big – I mean, the Combine is all about the interviews. It's, you know, it's about the medical stuff and the interviews. And at the end of the day, the testing stuff is good. Yeah, I mean, you want to check those boxes. You want to run the four five. You want to run the four seven as as a bigger guy. You know, as a quarterback, you know, you want to show avert. You want to show the pro agility that you you know you can change direction and move in the pocket a little bit. And obviously, you know, from a forty standpoint, it's kind of overrated for us. But um, you know, it's, it's the interviews are everything. You know, it's it's what makes this guy tick. You know, like. It, does he love football? Is he passionate about football? Um, is it a guy who wants to play 16 years? You know, like the, the most amazing thing about Tom Brady is is that he's still working to get better, right? Like if there's anybody kind of rest on the board a little bit, you know, it could be him at this point in his career, right? He's not. You know, like he's still at the end of the day just loves football and loves to compete. And that's, you know, the best guys I've been around love football and love to compete. You know, and it doesn't matter if it's football or it's cards. You know, they just they want to kill you. <laughs> so, you know, they have that killer instinct, and uh, you know, that's what keeps guys around, you know. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, you make a ton of money doing it, but, but uh, you know, would you show up to a park and, and, and play in a park with your buddies? And some of those guys would. You know, I truly believe that. So, um, you know, I think, you know, to answer your question, it's kind of, Kind of the combine is kind of overrated at times, and um, you know what's, what's underrated is the person. You know, at the end of the day, it's people forget that it's, it's it's who you are as a person. How do you fit in our fifty-three? You know, and do you, do you love football? And you are you a competitor? Like you, do you absolutely care about winning and losing. So um, you know, people forget that's the that's the majority of the of the combine is are you healthy, and what makes you tick. When you bring up the combine, one of my last questions for you was going to be, uh, what's the most important athletic trait for a quarterback? You mentioned the 40. Uh, obviously, you know that's not super important for a quarterback, but what is the most important athletic trait overall, whether it's tested at the combine or not? In your mind, what's the most important one? Um, you know, you know, people talk about broad and avert, obviously with explosion, not that we have to be the most explosive athlete in the world, but... Um... You know, pro agility is big because it's short movement, distance, change of direction, which, again, is kind of moving in the pocket, right? It's kind of like I'm dropping. i got to slide real quick, set my base and throw. I might have to climb the pocket. I might get pushed. i got to move real quick to a spot and throw. Um, you know, the, the days of, um, you know, dropping seven steps from under center and kind of standing there like a statue, you know, throwing posts or digs are over. You know, it's, you know, the neat thing about, I think about the position is, um, you know, it was the last two years, the first number one picks have been under 6-1. So um, yeah. it's it's neat to see that if you're a really good player and you're a baller and, uh, you know, you're going to have a shot, obviously, going really high. I mean, you know, I mean, let's be honest. Ten years ago, if I told you the last two picks would be whatever Baker is, six foot six one, you know, and um, obviously Kyler being, you know, between 5'9 and 5'10 and a half, depending on it. And, again, I've, I've never seen him. I've seen Baker, obviously, man at camp, but um, – you know, it, it, it's pretty neat to see. Like, if I told you 10 years ago, those were, would be the first pick two years in a row, you, you think I'm nuts. It'd have to be the 6'5", 230-pound guy. You know, and so, um, it's not a cookie-cutter thing anymore. We just need to see. You could just be – there's different ways of being a really good player. And then the last question I have for you, just more of a position-specific question. And this could be, uh, you know, contrived in a couple different ways. I want to ask you about the deep ball because uh, everybody loves a good deep ball. And obviously the, the, the way you throw a post is going to be different than the way you throw a wheel and the, different than the way you throw a fade or a back shoulder. But what does a good deep ball look like? What are the keys to a good deep ball if you're coaching up a quarterback? Um, you know, it, it, it's funny. Like, you know, my, my big thing with guys, and, um, and especially when you see the younger, like I have some really talented – uh, you know, Division One quarterbacks that I train, like you know, Kenny Pickett from Pitt, Norris Sukowski from Rutgers, and uh, Jared Garantano from Tennessee. You know, like they're such talented kids. Anthony Brown from Boston College. They all have elite arms. That's why they're they're scholarship kids. You know, but it's the ability of going and going from being a thrower, which most of them were in high school, you know, to a passer, which is the ability to change tempos 
and you know either drive the football, which we call it a one ball, right? So that that ball's on a line, the window's open, and I fire that thing. That's my fastball. You know, throw a two ball, which is a kind of a layer ball. So that's kind of like an up and over deal, where it's over that second level linebacker kind of player with you know deep overs and uh, you know digs, maybe curls. Um, you know, basics in a West Coast offense. That's twelve yard digs from the tight end slot player. You know, like those throws are usually. You know, they have to have velocity, but at the same time, it has to be up and over people, you know, which is kind of a hard thing to do. It's you got to practice it. Then, obviously, our last one would be our three ball, which is kind of what you're talking about, which is the post, you know, the go ball where it's got to be up and over, throwing a ball to a spot with some air. So, how I coach that really is uh, just think of a cannon. So, the farther a cannon wants to shoot, the higher it's got to raise. So, I, I compare that to our front shoulder. Our front shoulder has to pop up. And, and the higher that I want this ball to go, the more my front shoulder tilts up in the air. And then the ability to keep my eyes on the spot where I'm throwing it. So you see a lot of kids will throw the ball, and as they throw it, where do you think their eyes go? Their eyes go right to the ball because they want to see how pretty their spiral is, which means I don't follow through, and it kind of, you know, it's not a tight ball, and it kind of takes off on me and uh, doesn't really hit the spot I want. So it's the ability of getting your front shoulder up, you know, um, and, and following through to a spot out there, whether it's, you know, putting the ball in a hash for a post or putting the ball to the bottom of the numbers, you know, the college numbers. If I'm throwing a, a you know go route um, you know up the sideline, so um, and, and, and trusting your arm, it's still throwing with your hips. And you, know, you see a lot of guys try to throw a deep ball and it turns into like the javelin, or you know they kind of crow hop into it and they come unraveled and their front shoulder comes swinging open, and they're just you know things we think as a quarterback which help, we think it's helping us, it actually hurts us in the long run. And it's kind of staying throwing the football is a sequence, and, and you have to stay within your sequence. And the second you kind of unravel something within that sequence. You know, the things after, you know, so it's kind of like I teach in four parts, you know, so it's one, two, three, four. If I if I skip two and go to three, I'm going to be, there's something wrong here. And three and four are going to have to kind of do their job plus fix, you know, two, which wasn't, which is the thing I kind of skipped, you know. So, um, and you know, the biggest thing with the deep ball is getting it up on time. You know, it's, you see a lot of guys, you know, take the hitch, and it's kind of not there, and I'm kind of not sure if that safety's kind of doing a good job, kind of baiting them a little bit. It's you know, and they take the second hitch, and it's kind of like, oh, I got to get out there, and uh, and they're late. You know, it's the ability of, of making the right read if it's if it's man free, and I know I'm going to the outside receiver. It's kind of holding that safety for a count or two in the middle of the field and getting the ball up on time to a spot and letting that guy run underneath it. Well, Tony, I don't know if you've uh, spent time around. Um... Uh, Justin Herbert from Oregon, but he throws that two ball like as well as anybody that I've watched in the last uh, the last few years. If you, you describe the one, two, and three ball, he's uh, outstanding at hitting those guys on those inter- those deep in cuts, man. Like over the over the linebacker under the safety, uh, he lights it up. That's the it's the biggest thing I see with guys is, um, and that's usually the ball that lacks, right? Because when you're you know when you're younger, you you chuck it as far as you can, so guys kind of understand to throw a deep ball for the most part. And obviously the scholarship kids. Um, you know, they have scholarships because they throw the ball really hard most of the time. You know, it's the ability to understand how to throw like that two ball that you're describing. That's where you see the next jump as a quarterback. And I'll be honest with you, that's the majority of throws we make in a game. Yeah. You know, it's usually people take away the deep stuff and they take away the short stuff, and it's the ability to throw you know the ball in the seams and throw those deep in cuts, which are where you make your money. You know, it's those digs and curls, and uh, those are the moves the sticks kind of throws. You know, that's that third and seven to twelve. Area, you know, at the NFL, everybody runs that deep dagger, you know. So, I mean, that's 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 that dagger throw. It's that 18 to 20 yard speed cut dig in, and the ability to throw the ball over the nickel or or get it in that window right before the mic drops under it. You know, keep the ball on the front side. Um, you know, that's that's what separates guys. So, I'll actually see him. He's he's invited as a counselor, so I'll see him uh, at camp in, in June. So, I'm excited to see him spend it. Beautiful. Well, I'll be uh, looking forward to catching up with you, hearing how those guys did. Tony, appreciate the time here on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast, fueled by Gatorade. We'll talk to you again soon. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Fran. Just great stuff there from Tony and a lot of information about what goes into playing the quarterback position at a high level. And if you've got a young Eagles fan in your life or a young football fan in your life that wants to learn more about the game, I implore you, go check out the Eagles Junior Pro Day. And it's really the ultimate football experience for the young Eagles fan in your life. You can run through skills and drills with current Eagles players. You can meet Swoop. The cheerleaders, I'm sure, will be there. You can enjoy a full day of fun football activities right here Saturday, June 1st, right here in South Philly. So visit PhiladelphiaEagles.com slash JRPro 
today for tickets. I promise it's something that your young Eagles fan in your life will never, ever forget. All right. Great stuff again from Tony this week. And you can follow him on Twitter just like I do at TonyRaz03. And while you're at it, follow me on Twitter. I'm at FDuffy3. That's where you can find all the X's and O's content that we produce here at PhiladelphiaEagles.com as well as all the podcasts I'm a part of, whether it's this podcast or the Journey to the Draft podcast. And we continue to put out all this podcast content throughout the course of the year leading up to training camp. We're going to keep putting out this stuff on a weekly basis. And for the best way to support the show, because you know how much I appreciate everybody that promotes it on social media, but go on to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, wherever you listen, leave a five-star rating, leave a comment, let us know how you feel about the show, but then also... Leave us a question, and we're not afraid to answer it here on the show as well. And I wanted to give a shout-out to Swiss Assassin, who left a comment and a five-star rating on our Apple podcast page within the last couple of weeks, asking the following question. With the addition of Zach Brown to the Eagles, I just wanted to ask a question about linebackers and how you evaluate them. I'm watching both Devin White and Devin Bush prior to the draft, and I found that the two have very different play styles. Devin White seems to be the better player in pass coverage, but Devin Bush seems like a much more classic linebacker. Bush seems to square up ball carriers, drive through their body, while White seems to be a more grab and drag arm tackler. I see this as a concern with players that are bigger, faster, and stronger in the NFL. Do you see this as a concern at all? To me, Bush seems like the more well-rounded player, while White seems to be the better athlete with more upside and better pass coverage. So that's a great question, and I think it's really something that's interesting to follow in today's game. Look, the linebacker position is kind of seen as not very valuable because less of them are on the field now. You get more defensive backs that come onto the field in sub package. That means linebackers come off, but you still need linebackers that can be three down players in a defense. And while everybody still values pass coverage over the ability to defend the run, that's all well and good until you start giving up those big chunks on the ground. So you still need those linebackers to be able to operate in tight quarters, win on contact, and get ball carries to the ground more often than not. And so you can't have missed tackles. And to me, I think when you look at both these guys, I agree with your evaluation. I did prefer Devin Bush a little bit to Devin White. I can see the allure with Devin White. They're both outstanding players to me. They were both top 10 players in this draft, and they were drafted that way. But I think when you look at both guys, yeah, Devin White, a little bit more athletic and do a little bit more moving in reverse, was asked to do so at LSU. Devin Bush, on third down often, he wasn't asked to play as much in coverage. He was actually used more often as a blitzer, which can be a little bit of a red flag for people that want a, want a guy that can play in coverage because if he wasn't asked to do it in college, that's a little bit of a concern. But I think ultimately, when you look at both these guys, they both have the athletic skill set, both tested extremely well at the combine. The question with Bush will be, does he have the instincts to hold up in coverage? Does he have the ability to play in reverse? Because he will be asked to do that. Ultimately, what you don't want is for a linebacker to be a matchup problem for an offense to come out and say, you know what? We can put our running back one-on-one with this guy and feel confident that he can win in the passing game. That's something you don't want as a defense. So as long as those guys show the ability to not be that kind of uh, hole on a defense, then they're going to be okay. They're both outstanding when it comes to being able to play downhill. They can both finish at the ta- at the point of contact as a tackler. The question you have with Bush is, can he play in reverse? And he's a little bit better playing downhill than Devin White is. Both guys have leadership ability. They're both young. They both have great upside. So I can see the allure with both. But I agree with you. I think ultimately when you look at the linebacker position, like I said, you need the guy to not be lost out in space. That's really the number one thing. If the guy can hold up in coverage and be a three-down player, that's what you want in today's NFL. So great question there to Swiss Assassin. And thank you to all of you out there for your continued support of this show and all the rest of our podcast offerings at PhiladelphiaEagles.com. But that'll do it. Another week in the books here for the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. Again, take a few seconds. Go rate the show. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. And we'll keep making this show better each and every week. Until then, for everybody here at the Novacare Complex, I'm Fran Duffy. We'll see you next week.